pattern of Jewish history depends from its starting point until its end point depends on an active God in history. And it depends, in a sense, on the divine imagination proving to be stronger than the imagination of evil, if one could put it that way, if that's, if that's clear. What the Holocaust seemed to prove is that the imagination of evil was more powerful than the divine imagination in terms of its ability to affect history. Because the Holocaust was a moment of, of one can say, revelation of the Sitra Achra. It was a moment of revelation in its perfection. It was a moment of perfection of evil. And until then, until the, the Holocaust, there had not been, perhaps not since Itziat Mitzrayim, there had not been a moment of divine revelation that was as powerful in its way, as perfect in its way, as the divine revelation of the Shoah, as the, as the, as the anti-divine revelation of the Shoah. So that the, and, and the Nazis saw, certainly the, the, the quote, theologians of Nazism, and I think Nazism was very much a religion, an anti-religion, the, the theology of Nazism was to, was to disprove the presence of God in the world, which is one of the reasons that the Jewish people was chosen for destruction, because the Jews were the people who said that we stand for the presence of God in history. Through our history, you will see a reflection of God's presence in history. Through the eternity of the Jewish people, against all odds, you will see the eternity, a reflection of the eternity of the divine. And the Nazis said, OK, we're going to take you up on that challenge, and we will prove that there is no God. And it's the old pagan taunt that we read in Tehillim, um, um, uh, where is your God? Where is your God? And, and that became, in a certain sense, the, the, the taunt I would even say the, the theological rationale for the final solution, to prove that you can create a system of evil and there would be no, intervent, no divine intervention, no salvation. So the god of history emerged from the Shoah in, in a state of, uh, of uh, near, near, near fatality. So on three levels, the Shoah created a, presented a, a, an overwhelming challenge to the Jewish people. To recreate the Jewish people physically, restore the psychological self-image of the Jewish people. And the third is to rescue the relevance of the God of history. conceives its mission, what Zionism is set, setting out to do, changes in 1945, consciously or not, in some ways consciously, in other ways, in other ways not. Zionism set out to meet these three challenges and to undo, to reverse the consequences of the Shoah. So the first challenge, of course, was the most conscious on the part of Zionism, the most overt. Zionism understood that its mission now was to bring in as many Jews as it could into the land of Israel, which was very different from Zionism until 1939. Certainly, labor Zionism did not see its mission as in gathering all the Jews immediately. It was very much a, a sense of selective immigration, of Zionism, of labor Zionism working with small cadres who could prepare a, a socialist infrastructure to prepare for the, for the 
socialist experiment that they envisioned Israel becoming. Zionism in 1945, including labor Zionism, reverses course and realizes it has to it has to open the gates by force if necessary and bring all those ready to come, whether or not they will be chalutzi or not. So labor Zionism, the dominant stream within the Zionist movement, changes course as a result of the Shoah and commits itself successfully, astonishingly successfully, to the ingathering of the Jewish people reconstituting the Jews from shattered diaspora communities to a nation, a people. And just how successful that movement was, I think even surprised labor Zionists. As many of you know, uh, the labor Zionist leaders in the 1950s had misgivings about how far to extend this net of rescue. Uh, do we bring in the Jews of Arab countries en masse? And of course, the decision was made to do that, but it was not at all clear that that would be the policy of labor Zionism. So gradually, the Shoah transformed mainstream Zionist thinking from a, a, an approach that championed a, a, a gradualist, a careful, laying of, of a foundation of, a, of an ideal state to realizing that we don't have the luxury to deal with that anymore and that the mission of Zionism, and Ben-Gurion represents this transformation more than any other Zionist leader. Ben-Gurion after the Shoah is not the same Ben-Gurion from before the Shoah. And he basically gives up the old kibbutz dream of creating a, 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 a communal Israel and he moves gradually toward the policy of Mamadiyut, of statehood, whose policy is to bring in all of the, the, the exiles. So the first successful challenge that the Zionist movement meets is to physically restore the Jews to an intact or reasonably intact nation with a common language, more or less a common sense of peoplehood, and a, a common political framework. Uh, the next challenge that Zionism made, met was the psychological challenge of restoring Jewish self-confidence. And it did so, of course, by creating a successful army and of winning wars. The notion, parenthetically, that 50 years later, there would be Jews in the diaspora or in Israel who would feel squeamish about an excess of Jewish power would have seemed ludicrous, to say the least, in 1945, regardless of what the Jew's politics was in 1945. Extreme left to extreme right, there certainly was no ambivalence about the necessity for Jews to have some form the fact, I would say, that some Jews can be squeamish at all about power attests to just how successful the Zionist transformation psychologically of the Jewish people has been in the span of a single generation. Uh, 